So our next talk is uh, held by Sue. I'm ho <laughs> I hope I don't get this wrong. Uh, Sue Brata Bani. Correct. Okay. <laughs> very very well. So he's telling us a, a little something about how to get from a fairly complex schematic to a solid core boot firmware, and I'm really excited about this talk. So please give a warm round of applause for the Prata Vanik. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shubrata Banik. I'm part of Intel Core Boot development team. Today, I'm here to talk about Core Boot IE main board porting with Intel FSP 2.0. Hope you find this session interesting. And by at the end of the session, you got to know something more about Intel FSP and its interface with uh, Core Boot. And most importantly, this, might, this session might help you to ease your main boot porting job from now onwards. So uh, before going to my first slide, I'll just try to level set the expectation from this session. We will try to achieve here the core boot and FSP interfacing part in order to initialize your main board from your schematics. I assume you are having your reference schematics based on certain Intel SOC. And here we'll talk about what are the different configuration knob you need to configure in order to initialize your platform. Um, so before going there, this is my email ID. Uh, you can send me an email if you have some feedback about the current code boot design and all, or something needs to be done. I'll try to reach you all. So um, this is a high-level uh, code boot architecture that we maintain today at Intel. Uh, FSP, then SOC, then main boards. What is FSP? I'll come later. So if you see the SOC and the main board layer, right? So the SOC layer, it, it, it typically like Skylake, KB Lake, and followed by all SOCs. And at Intel, in last one year, we tried to re-architect the code boot pieces and try to make a common code out of that and create a layer called Intel Common Code, where all the common SOC initialization reside there. This basically helps us to minimize our SOC porting time over generation to generation. And using that SOC layer, we have created our first reference design. Like for an example, Intel come up with the SOC, take example of Skylake and KB Lake. Intel also responsible to provide the first reference code for a board. Like for an example, KB Lake RVP or Skylake RVP. We provide the code so that when next time, when OEM comes and do the copy exact model, they can, they can use those code, the firmware, the board code, and create their own design. So overall, so this is the code boot stack today at Intel. So what is FSP? I'll just come to the next file. So FSP is a piece where it does the entire SOC initialization. It combines your CPU initialization, your PCH initialization, your MRC initialization, and whatnot. It's a, it's a, it's a binary blob with having certain entry and exit point. What those points are, I'll just come later. But today, the purpose of FSP is to deal with any bootloader. Today, our talk scope will be with code boot. Code boot as a bootloader, how FSP is gelling with, and what are those configuration parameters we need to provide that. So when we start in uh, 2014 time frame, maybe Vincent can uh, rectify that, the spec was like a FSP 1.0 spec. And over the time, with our community feedback, specifically like feedback from Googlers like Aaron and Duncan, it helped to change a lot in the spec. And today, we are with FSP 2.0 spec. What the specs provide, it's provided several entry and exit points. So as you can see, the journey here, earlier we used to have a couple of undefined entry and exit points. Now we have categorized those into the three primary part as FSPT, which does your FSP temp ramp in it. And then we have FSPM, which does your MRC, like your FSP memory in it. And the last is that FSP silicon in it. Apart from that, there are certain notify phases and all where the bootloader transfers the call to the FSP and FSP does certain kind of locking for your PCH and CPU registers. So how, how the FSP works? As you understand, this is a binary blob and it works with bootloader based on certain inputs or configuration because bootloader is the master of the platform. It knows my platform very well. So those inputs are basically the configuration data that we call as a UPD. So you have to understand that each FSP blobs, right, that your FSP M, FSP uh, T, or S, those are containing some kind of configuration data that we call as a UPD. So those are like basically your inputs to the, uh, to the FSP itself. 
So your bootloader owns that input. It provides based on your SOC design and mainboard design, and then FSP go and execute those. So now this input can be broadly categorized into two parts. One is the statically configured UPT. The second is the dynamic configured UPT. Statically configured UPT, the, as the name suggests, that might be based on like certain delta between your uh, different SOC to the other SOC, or, or the requirement that change from a different OS to another OS, where your bootloader only to take any decision. And whereas the dynamic UPT, where your bootloader need to process certain data to get certain decisions and update those UPTs. And then if I further classify those UPTs, I will classify it into another two parts. One is your SOC UPTs, another is your mainboard UPTs. So SOC UPTs that with a generation of SOCs, we may try to change those UPT variables. Like for example, your um, um, IGD size and all those things, your uh, MMIO size and all. But the, the most important part is your mainboard configuration. That within SOC, based on your mainboard to mainboard, like for an example, OEM X versus OEM Y, they design two different mainboard, and the schematic will be different. Based on that, then we need to change those parameters. As a scope of today's talk, we're just focusing on the mainboard part of the FSP UPTs. OK, so here are the sample of the FSP, uh, the UPT headers. If you go to the vendor code, you may find those there. Uh, just make sure that you are having a FSP binary with a similar or like a compatible version of the FSP UPD as well, because the binary has to be compatible with your FSP header. Now assume that you have your FSP binary, you have also have your FSP header, and you have your bootloader configured with all the policy requirements that will come to the next files. So this is how your typically your core boot and FSP interface works. You stitch it together, you flash your core boot.rom into the system, your reset vector holds by your core boot. Then core boot does your real mode to protected mode switching for IA platform. Then followed by it comes when you do not have a real memory, you need to initialize your cache as RAM. So cache as RAM initialization can be done in two ways. One, you can use FSPT or majority of the Chrome side of the code boot story where we do not use FSPT. We use the native code in code boot which does the cache as RAM setup. So now you have your FSPT call or native code boot code call which, which initializes your cache as RAM. And now you are again controlled back to the bootloader. Again, your bootloader needs to fill in all your FSP M related UPDs to call your MRC initialization, memory training, and all. And once it again exits from that um, FSP M, uh, your core boot needs to tear down your cache because now we have switched everything to the main memory. And um, before calling to the FSP S, we might need to uh, fill in all the FSP S related UPDs, which will be based on your controller, the controller you want to enable. Like for an example, I want to uh, have a different USB uh, stack on your my uh, pl platform. I want to initialize certain I2C versus GSPY interface and all. So finally, when the FSP S exit, the bootloader does the um, PCI enumeration. And finally, it handed over the control to the payload after it locked down certain registers, PCI register and all, in a notify phase. So these are overall typical scenario between code boot and uh, your FSP. Anytime FSP think that you need to reset a platform for certain configuration change, it transfer the call to the bootloader and bootloader know what kind of platform reset it could be, warm versus cold or global reset, and it handles in that way. So um, with coming here, we, we understand the core boot and FSP interface and all. So now I have taken a sample example of a Intel-based mainboard. So this is a typically a folder structure looks like in your mainboard directory, where you are having roughly around 30 to 35 files here. So all the configuration for your mainboards to, to support your mainboards and to provide all those UPD to the FSP so the FSP can initialize your platform should be, should be done here. So all those files are, one is kconfig, uh, I'll come there, what we do in the source files and all. Second will be a romstage.c, where typically we, we just fill in all the uh, FSP M related policies and all. Third will be RAM stage, where mostly we go and update the FSP S related UPDs. And the device.cb. As the, all the core boot people know, the device.cb is basically a place where all the configuration data exists in, in terms of the better readability and all. So as a developer or a user, we majorly need to focus on those four files to port a new mainboard and to change the FSP configuration parameter and all. So we'll go one by one to those files, right? 
So first is the key config. So here we comes and tell what kind of FSP spec your mainboard support. For an example, here we're going to tell that FSP 2.0 is the latest spec. Our KBLEG SOC supports FSP 2.0. Second will be your FSP M related UPTs. So now FSP M related UPTs can be categorized into two parts. One is your MRC training related UPTs. Second will be your device configuration related UPTs. So MRC related UPTs can be again further classified based on your memory design you have. For an example, you are having memory down solution where you may need to have your SPD data from your vendor. So you just get the data from your vendor, or if you have a SODIM kind of configuration that you typically find in Intel RVPs and all, where you can read the SPD via SMBus interface. So uh, why not we go to the uh, sample UPDs? So these are the like pretty used or like most used UPDs we have in FSPM, right? So as I mentioned that based on your MRC design, the shoulder down or it is a uh, SODIM co configuration, you have to choose from where to get the SPD parameters and in. And then next it comes in your um, DQ map, your DQS byte mapping between DRAM and CPU, and then followed by RCOM and RCOM target. So those are typical values that change between your DRAM type and CPU type. To get those values, so those values will be changed based on your schematics to schematics. What kind of DIM you are using, what kind of CPU you are using, and all, right? So. As, as I worked with, while preparing this file, I worked with the Intel MRC team, and they advised me to send this message clearly to the community that you people feel free to reach the Intel MRC enabling team, and they'll be happy to provide you this kind of details. And we are also planning to get certain tool into the open source where those data can be fit in based on your schematics, and you get all those parameters, the FSP configurer parameter by your own. So that, that may take little time because the tool they are started creating based on our feedback. So right now, the best approach, you go and approach to our uh, Intel uh, MRC en enabling team, memory enabling team, they will help you out. Apart from that, uh, if you see the device side of the parameter, that might be uh, PCI root port configuration. You may have different root ports in your SOC capabilities, and what are the root port your actual device is connected? For example, you are having a Wi-Fi or a NVMe connected on PCI root port 9 and 10. You only need to provide those kind of port mapping. And last is that your serial port. Like for an example, you want to get a debug log of the FSP, you know, to specify which port we want to get a log. So for, for an example, typically what we do, we use a config, that same config we're using in core boot to get serial log, we just specify the same config to get the FSP debug log as well. So we have covered the FSP M part. So now let's come to the FSP S configuration. As I mentioned, FSP S configuration is totally depend on your schematic design, your mainboard design. You may decide to have a different USB connected to the different controller, right? You may not have all the USB port used in your mainboard design. You need to explicitly come and tell what all the USB port you want to use it versus whether it is USB 2.0, whether it is USB 3.0, Type-C, whatnot. And also like your configuration for your Wi-Fi or your BT configuration and your storage. You may, you may not have SATA, for an example. Let me go to the most used UPDs. So this is a pretty widely used UPTs that we use for our, our mainboard to mainboard porting part. Uh, for an example, take a look into the SATA enable. If you do not have SATA in your final design, you don't need to set that UPTs. For an example, the uh, PCH LAN, you don't want to have your onboard LAN, you, you just go and disable that. Or whereas you want to have the EMMC uh, enable with the HS400, you just need to go and enable those UPTs. So it does all the EMMC tuning parameter by its own, right? And as, as this uh, foil suggested, so most of the, your uh, configuration data against the SOC. What are the capability SOC provide and what are the capability your mainboard want to explore from the SOC? Based on that, you're just providing those configuration parameters. Okay, and this is a sample example of our device tree. Everybody knows that. This is the place where we go and tell, okay, this is my root port number we want to enable. And this is my clock source programming and all. And these are my USB uh, port that we want to enable versus not enable with a different configuration. So uh, let me uh, go to a, a sample mainboard porting work, right? It's like a real hands-on kind of thing. So I have designed a, a reference schematics here. So in the schematics, we have a KB like SOC with a, a LPDDR3 with dual channel memory uh, on your, and then you have your display over EDP. 
and you have a bunch of uh, USB device, and from storage side, you are having EMMC and SD controller, and for connectivity, you are having BT, and uh, Wi-Fi over PCI Express would put nine. So all this data can be derived from your schematics. Uh, so as we know that, first thing is that we have to go and select the kconfig to tell, OK, this is my FSP 2.0 spec supports. I didn't capture that intentionally, because normally we do that. So now as a step one, first we need to provide FSP M related UPD updates. As I mentioned there, we are having a memory down solution. So I need to approach my vendor, uh, the memory vendor, to get my SPD data. If it is a SO team, you don't need to go to your uh, memory vendor. Rather than you just provide the SMBus address. That re referring to the earlier reference of your uh, UPD list. So once you have that, these are sample code pieces from the code boot that you got your SPD data, you assign to the respective uh, SPD pointer. There will be two channels we to told. There will be channel 0, DIM 0, channel 1, DIM 0. And then comes to your bunch of uh, UPDs that will be changed or that has to modify based on your reference schematics. For, for example, your DQ and DQ byte map, and then RCOM and RCOM target. As I already explained that, uh, this will be changed based on the memory type and the SOC you are using. I try to capture here the KV Lake reference values. If your SOC is something other than KV Lake, you please get the same, same value from our uh, Intel uh, memory enabling team. And for the serial debug, if you have a FSP debug binary available in your code base, you can try to set this UPD to get the log from the, uh, the, the FSP for the log from the same UART port we have. And then this is the FSP S UPDs. So this page is all about referring your schematics. So first is that USB configuration. USB configurations depend on your board design you have. You, you might have a convertible design. You might have a two-in-one design. You may have your USB device over your daughter card versus you are having USB on your main board, might, might be right. So these are like your macros. Those are like USB 2 port long and all. Those are macros. Those macros internally handle all those different file settings for the USB and all, right? So you don't need to bother about those because there are ample amount of macros given, given and those values are assigned to the FSP UPD internally. Only thing you need to bother to provide the OC pin programming. And OC pin programming is again something that if you look at your schematics, you will got to know what is the OC pin for a certain USB port you have. You provide those details and a certain, a certain port where you don't need to have OC pin programming. For example, I think for BT, we don't need to provide the OC pin programming. You go and skip that one. For the LPSS one, so LPSS, we call it like a, any your uh, I2C and your GSPY or your SPY or the UART, we call LPSS. So here, this depends on your, the different, so here, the, like different touch screen, the trackpad or whatnot you have, right? So based on those. So where you use your uh, I2C interface, or where, where you use your TPM and all. So in majority cases, we want to configure those in a PCI mode. It's, a, it's again a requirement from the kernel, in, in which mode kernel wants to have this. You may find one interesting one, that is a UART2. It's a IO skip in it. This is because typically in the Chrome side of this world, we try to use UART2 for a, a, our serial debug and all, like to get a serial log. And we, we have already initialized that in core boot before giving a control to FSP. So we are telling FSP, don't try to reinitialize it, because it, it involves lots of GPA programming and all. So this is the way you, you can tell FSP to skip certain control and initialization. Then come to your storage part. It is pretty straight and simple that you have your EMC controller you want to enable with a different uh, configuration mode, and same with the SD card. For the connectivity, again, it's referred to your schematics. You may have your schematics clearly mentioned which clock source number this device is mapped to, and what will be the PCI root port where this device is connected. So, you, so here, for example, it's a root port 9 where you have your wi the Wi-Fi module sits on. So it's a zero-based map. So you provide like an offset at eight. You have your uh, Wi-Fi connected. And clock source number is two, where we just map those connections. For the graphics initialization, you need to prepare a VBT. That we prepare based on the panel specification. You have your panel spec given. Using that, we try to create the VBT point, uh, your VBT data table. That, and that data table, you need to locate from your CBFS. That is how today we do in code boot, And assign the same into your graphics configuration pointer. FSP takes care of the panel initialization. 
So, so here, mostly, whatever the device I have mentioned in my early schematics design, we try to cover majority of the initialization. There might be one or two configuration. For example, you may have your NVMe over a PCI Express. So then you need to go and enable those here. So certain thing can be added or de deleted. So this is a, typically from the, the reference board design that I mentioned. Having said that, uh, it's a pretty much done. But yeah, there are certain things. For an example, your GPIO programming, your ACPI programming, and all. Those will be like your main board porting part. And when you do a copy exact model, you basically leverage from one design to other design. But nothing too specific to the FSP as such. So I'm just ending here uh, and open for the question and answer. Please let me know if you have. So OK, well, it's time to take questions. There are questions, beautiful. So uh, if we wanted to play around with some of this KB Lake stuff that you're talking about, specifically the configuration for the kernel, is there a place where we could go uh, maybe on Intel's uh, kernel on GitHub where there's a branch where we could check out some of this configuration? Yes, so actually all of our KB Lake code are, are there in the open source, right? We just go to codeboot.org. So codeboot.org having all the KB Lake SOC. And there might be today, I think there are more than 10 sample platform, including the, our RVPs are coded there. So all the code base that I've just copied, some code snippet and all, all from the open source code base. And I think some places I was referring to the file names uh, might be like this. Uh, like you can, you can go and refer to those from there. Yeah. Okay. OK, I have to say I wasn't prepared for this <laughs> to end so early. So we have like until 3 PM for questions. <laughs> so we can just write quick, quickly write a book with all the questions in it so, and, and hand it to you. And yeah, we can go over it like we have so much time. Oh, is it? <laughs> so I should, I should revise it one more time? <laughs> you have yeah, like a second having... talk you can hold, like a, <laughs> like a small one, like an anecdote or something. <laughs> no, really, I can take questions, a lot of questions. OK, one, two. Hi, um, one question. Um, do you plan in any way, or have you heard of the, um, um, there's a utility for um, the old Intel devices, um, Sandy Bridge and um, uh, uh, Ivy Bridge, um, I forgot the name, which uh, Vladimir um, uh, Autoport, um, which he uh, wrote in Go, which makes a port kind of easy and which collects certain um, data from the running system. Okay. And then more or less creates already a template for core boot, which only has to be minimally uh, be adapted. Um, do, are you planning something like this to make porting even more easy for um, new Intel boards? Uh, let me try to uh, ask you again, right? So you, you mean that you have flashed or you have your duty up and running. You try to extract the, the spy. Yeah, as the vendor spine. I have the vendor firmware. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and then you want to uh, add certain code pieces and all, and need to re-stitch and rerun it, like, like, like this. Well, then there is like Intel tool, which gets the GPIO configuration or something like this, dumps okay. it, and ah, then okay. this is converted into core boot source code, more or less. OK, so, so yeah, I think, I think this is something that talk we have uh, early of this year with, with uh, Duncan that we were thinking that there might be some kind of tool that today we have uh, with Windows platform, it's not on the Chrome side, right? Where it is pretty easy to configure your GPIOs and all, right? So there could be two ways to work on that. Either you run on the same on, the, on your duty itself, when it is booted and all, or, me, or you halt it somewhere. You basically override those memory data and by some mean, by some tool and all. So ultimately, when system boots, system boots with your own configuration, not that what your BIOS has been pre-programmed and all, right? So, so to do that, we are already talking where, like internally, right? To to increase the more debug capability in code boot and to help the developer community to to hack certain pieces and in a good mean to configure them back and to boot it again, right? Uh, uh, like me, maybe your GPI or ACPI could be a good example of doing that. Just to change your ACPI or GPIO, you don't need to stitch your entire BIOS image. It might, you might be halt at some, like any given console or somewhere, and you update those data and simply boot to OS again. If, if that is the question, we are working on it. Yeah. 
so can you explain how Intel decides which chipsets are going to be supported through FSP or how we can, uh, like how, how a potential customer might um, ask for specific support for a particular chip? Okay, so yeah, I will, I would like to add uh, Vincent also to answer this quick question. Let me try to provide what story I have from my side, right? So typically, now the plan that we have, all the new SOCs, right, should be having the FSP support, right? And from the generation, like, like a little bit old generation, I'll ask if Vincent know the answer might be, what are the, like, from where we decided to have a FSP support? getting your workout today. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, as um, Sabrata said, uh, we have FSP 2.0 for the latest uh, client SOCs, Apollo Lake, Sky Lake, Cabby Lake. And going forward, we really want to have a unified roadmap. So upcoming, working with the Xeon teams about having it for core, we have it for some microservers. So yeah, don't have a, it's, don't have a forward-looking Intel roadmap to share, but we're working with all the product teams such that we can have FSP 2.0 so that when different divisions produce, whether it's our IoT client where Sabrata is representing or server, as we work with the upstream um, open source communities, it can be the same experience. But today it is inconsistent. If you look at GitHub, we don't have the best coverage and we're really trying to get FSP 2. So the workflow you sh um, Sabrata showed for like a Chromebook, you could do in the future for servers whether microserver or um, Xeon. Yep. But we're not there yet, and a lot of feedback from folks in the room here have helped motivate us to accelerate some of that um, roadmap alignment. Thanks, Vincent. So, any more questions? Yeah, Ron has some. Keep them coming. <laughs> um, so the one question I get a lot is, I get it today too, does FSP, for a chipset and apply UEFI then is not there anymore, right? So does the UEFI partitioning of SEC to PEI to DXE, does okay. that go away and become FSP and does it get replaced or how's that all supposed to work? Um, yeah, maybe again I will ask <laughs> Vincent to give the answer, but yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the question was SEC, PEI, DXE versus FSP. So the FSP, as described by Subrata, is really the essentially a subset of the PEI phase, okay. memory initialization, Asian system agent. But the SEC equivalent is typically done by your cool. mainboard vendor. Because okay. one of the things FSP doesn't do is state management. It's really stateless. So the platform code is responsible for um, you know, securing the FSP as part of its overall update. Say you're booting and you want to save the memory settings, the platform code has to do that. Um, the server work we've opened is actually a couple firmer volumes, which is more than an FSP. And then as I described in the keynote, this distinction between FSP and firmer volumes like your use case, we want to kind of break that down and sort of have the silicon firmer volumes that expose the FSP interface if you want to do this style of usage or maybe a fatter one to do um, the kind of usage you're doing with Linux boot. The challenge with just having sort of the boot block as a binary, a fat binary, is the richness of configuration you may need to do for your system board. So invariably, invariably some of the complexity of FSP, these UPDs are really driven by board layout variability, right? And so you sort of need that anyway. But we want to make the silicon FV and FSP sort of one and the same and then have a more consistent roadmap. So if you're doing this workflow or you're dropping it into a sort of boot block style thing Linux boot needs, it's just a different yeah. flavor. Um, but yeah, the work, the thing you're doing does more than FSP, but it's very much specific to some of your main board targets. If you tried to drop that into another main board, you have some yeah. things baked in, whereas FSP purposely is SOSP only specific, so it has to expose more board specific configuration. And that drives some of the complexity. Yeah. So, yeah, the beast of board variability is always there, right? So, no. <laughs> it's a good way to make you stop. <laughs> no, I don't want to stop you, really.
Hi. Um, Hi. So I understand that Intel is not uh, willing to liberate the FSP at this time, um, but are there things that could be done to... Um, you mean source code? You mean source code or like a binary blob? No, source code. Oh, yeah. okay. To, okay. To liberate it in the sense that it becomes okay. free software. Okay. Yeah. Um, so are there things that could be done to simplify the community's work in replacing the FSP with like native free code? So for instance, providing more entry points so that um, some just parts of the FSP could be replaced one after the other so that eventually we could get rid of the whole thing and have native code like on the, the old Intel platforms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, yeah, I'll come there. So um, in my session, I'll... I was not conveying any matches saying that Intel is not willing to give the FSP source code. <laughs> I didn't mention that, right? <laughs> so I think our Intel team, uh, Vincent can add me there. So we were looking forward right now a binary support model, but slowly we are also planning to see how we can make a, a big chunk of the FSP code available in the open source. Or why not having a FSP toolkit or like a, we have the SDK, right? something like a FSP DK or like a software development kit where you can create your own binary out of that kit, right? So we were working on that. And in that, those cases, your feedback will be valuable, right? And, and let me put the value addition for the FSP. Because uh, for me, from 2015, I was working in Coreboot team and have done several power on with that FSP, right? If you can ask me to do a new SOC power on, it is very, very easy with FSP. Because as in session, we try to capture to support your main board, you, you only need to bother about those UPDs alone. And a firmware guy who has a close knowledge about your schematics can map all those UPD perfect. There is no way system can halt. System can boot very fast. And in the power on, right, when you go to the IBB or you go to the OEM and all, right, for a power on, the booting is very important to us. Maybe once you go and all, right, we figure out more configurable option. And I think from KB Lake onwards, we try to add more configurable parameter there. So you may find, nowadays you may find, there are more configuration parameters than you need actually. For all the possible uh, configure option in SOC, we may have a UPD associated to that. So might not we need to bother about all those SOC parameters. Because to do a new SOC mainboard porting, Intel might absorb that work. But that is the reason I didn't capture the SOC mainboard, the SOC side of the porting. If I get an opportunity to do the SOC mainboard porting, I'll try to capture that as well in, in some session. How we do the... SOC porting from one generation to another generation using FSP. No, hope that answered your question. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can still take questions, but if there aren't any, uh, we can get a small break till uh, 3 p.m. where the next talk starts. Hey, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank yeah. Oh, and give a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. All right. Thank you.